how many of you have ever had uh, a misheard lyric? Misheard? Yes. Oh, good. If you tell me, come tell me about it afterwards. I really want to hear about it. So forever, I thought that uh, John Fogarty sang, "I see a brand new horizon." Uh, instead of Bad Moon Rising, it was Brand New Horizon. It was like much better. I don't know why. So if you, if you have one of those, come tell me about it. Please come tell me about it. This is about one of those um, misheard lyric type of things. All right. <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is Zombie Cat Elegy, or How to Save Your Sex Life in Five Easy Steps. One. First, put the cat out. There's going to be sex, I promise. But first, a story. Once there was, and twice there wasn't, two boys walking down the street in Constantinople, both wearing vests and red fez, pants held up by string, bare football playing feet, and the street dust is yellow. One boy walks behind the other on stumpy legs. The first has crescent moon shoulder blades, and solid hairy calves. Between their carefully separated hands is a sack. The sack is meowing. It's clawing. It's making little burlap bumps here and there, pulling at its rope. The boys walk this way past the wide gutters of Constantinople. Sometimes the water runs clear, and you can see the gold tiles wash from Hagia Sophia. Sometimes the water runs fast, and you can see the chips from the blue mosque. Sometimes it runs brown, and you can see that someone upstream is taking the shit. Out of the bag, a claw or a whisker sticks out the knot like a divining rod, and feels that the water is near, and so are the dockside tanneries. And either way, things are not looking good for this stray gray tabby in the bag. The boys arrive on the dock at orange sky sundown, drop the bag. It goes, meow. One boy says, can we just leave it here, go play football? He's looking at the taller boy's upper lip where fine golden hairs are sprouted overnight. You're scared, says the other boy. Eyelashes sweeping the floor. But what if it grants us three wishes? And what if there is mercy? And what if all of God's creatures? The bag is not listening to this speech. The bag is doing little somersaults, trying to skimper, skedaddle the way, away from the boys and the hungry lapping waters. You're being a girl, says the taller boy, turning away. And that's all it takes. Outside the call to prayer, outside the blue tiles, outside the rotting chemical purple tannery smell, the younger boy picks up the bag, takes it to the cold gray water, and holds it down until all the fight is gone. He makes wishes anyway, one for a football, one for a gold-plated yacht to take him to America, and one we don't know. The year is 1930, and one of these boys is my father. If a Turkish stray cat could think. It might think, maybe I can swim. Maybe I can be a mer-cat. Maybe I can be part of that world. But the water rushes up and around its head, fur flattening like storm sunflowers arabesque. Two, talk about it. Last night, you said to me, it's happening to us. It's inevitable. It's happening to my friends. It's happening to your friends. And we're next in line. I'm telling you it's happening. What's happening, I say? There is water dripping from the ceiling. And outside, a stray cat is meowing at the door. You say, lesbian deathbed. That's a myth, I say. Anyway, it's bed death, not deathbed. <laughs> What's the difference? <laughs> one's a desert, and one's a black hole. One's permanent, and the other one results in ghosts. One, you have to bury the body. The other one, there's no body at all. Pay attention, small word, big difference. I don't see a difference, you say. Come to bed. But the fear, the water rushing in, the tangled burlap. I think of all the things that are legal in this country, so long as one adult is consenting, like waterboarding. I think of all the things I've failed to stand up against. And behind the scrim of time, one cat bloats in that waterway between Europe and Asia, Constantinople and Istanbul. It swallows the tiles and the prayers and the tannery chemicals. And this is where it begins if you have to ask, 
but you don't. Come to bed, no. Three, make the bed. My first deathbed was my father's. Bright yellow, queen-sized, sagging around his dumpling shape and his lungs drowning him three miles from any ocean. I wanted to ask, where were you during the war? I wanted to ask, which boy were you? The one who drowned a cat or the other one? I wanted to ask, where were you in the 60s? But he was underwater on his bed and I, to him, I was a girl. He surfaced once to gasp a sentence in French, the syntax so perfect I'll never forget it. It has become for me very difficult to converse, he said. I didn't know what to say after that. A dead cat backstroked between us. This is what I know about the man. He was born in Constantinople, grew up in Istanbul. He was a poor kid on a football scholarship. He was Muslim or he was Protestant or he was atheist, which is to say he was pretending not to be Jewish. Pretending that all his family didn't speak Ladino, where were you during the war? Instead, he was Turkish and he became American. Small words, big difference. This is what I remember about my father. He wore the jalaba, he read romances, he told stories of Nasruddin Hoja and his donkey. And once when I was tiny and I ran and I was lost in what felt like a dark and terrible forest, but was really probably three trees, he caught me and picked me up and said what fathers sometimes say, that I would never be lost. And he told the immigrant cover story many of us have heard and told it different every time. That he arrived in New York with nothing but glass cutters in his pocket. That he arrived in New York with nothing but worry beads in his pocket. That he arrived in New York with nothing but a deck of cards in his pocket. That he arrived with nothing but all the treasures, all the treasures of the exotic orient in his pocket. That he arrived with nothing, I tell you, nothing at all. Or maybe he arrived with a dead cat in his pocket. We stopped talking when I transformed in his eyes from girl, from child to girl. Small world, small word, big difference. Of course, I was astray. Compare, contrast, another deathbed. His sister, my aunt, dying of a disease that seems to have afflicted a certain kind of woman of her generation. The disease of no husband, the disease of short hair and cigarettes, of 100 puff pastry cigarette bariki rolled so tightly around a minted feta. Her deathbed for me was an email, subject line, sorry, you've run out of ants. In this family, we're not sentimental. In this family, we might be drowners of cats. This year, I had my first Facebook deathbed, a post between cat videos, status, I'm not here anymore. Likes will be construed as hugs. Likes will be construed as prayers. Likes will be construed as two little fingers pointing up. Like this so it doesn't go away. I heard you can turn people into things after you die, finally objectified once and for all. You can squeeze grandma's ashes into a diamond. That's nice. You can cremate your lover and have them poured into a dildo. That's great. Don't do that with grandma. At first, <laughs> at first I thought I wanted that, and then it worried me because what if I haunt you with this dead cat, and then you have to call in Ed and Lorraine Warren, the mediums with their Bibles, to come exercise your sex toys. So I decided this, when I die, I want to be made into something really tacky, something embarrassing forever that you won't be able to get rid of. When I die, make me into a sexy leg lamp with gilded edges. When I die, make me an alabaster poodle neon telephone. Make me a coffee cup. Make me into a t-shirt, t-shirt that says, my girlfriend died and all I got was this fucking t-shirt. <laughs> And then my deathbed can be the back of your closet, bottom drawer, where you put the pants that don't fit you and where it smells the most like you. Yes, I'm getting to bed, one more page, I promise. Of my father, we had two things. One, a box of ashes that wouldn't float out to sea. And two, this dead cat that won't leave me alone. It has hollow bones and little X's for eyes and is waiting for me right behind that door. I'm coming to bed, I promise. Four, role play if it helps. So if a Facebook deathbed and an email deathbed, why not a lesbian deathbed for my father? Fine, now we're both girls, see how it feels. First, give everyone face piercings and arm tattoos and great hair and beanies, and here we are at Mango, my father and me. And he's had three too many gin tonics, and the line to the bathroom is way too long, and he's so over it. And we smoke cigarettes, and I get to ask him anything I want, 
but we play that game where we make things funny by adding in bed. <laughs> where were you during the war? In bed. Where were you during the first occupation of Palestine? In bed. Where were you during the 50s and 60s and 70s, and how do you want me to live my life? In bed. Did you ever hurt anyone? Did you ever kill anyone? Did you ever drown any cats? And how am I supposed to figure out a masculinity, and then a femininity, and then a me? And I would like to admit to him that sometimes I'm lost, and I'd like to admit to him that sometimes I'm not really a girl, or at least not just a girl, and I would like to drag him onto the dance floor because, oh my god, they're playing our song. But before that, he needs to teach me to tie Windsor. And if his lungs get tired in this fantasy, e.g. from being out of breath, e.g. from dancing too much, I would totally let him crash on my couch. And if he can't sleep, I would totally sing him this song we took with us the first time we did the immigrant thing, running out of Spain 500 years ago with nothing but guitars in our pockets. Durme, durme, querido hijo. Durme, durme con sabor. I can't believe I did that. By the time I get to bed, there's a dead cat memory there instead of you. It's clammy and smells like brine and amber, and we curl up together under the burlap sheets. Five last. Repeat. Pop quiz. When a cat is drowned at dusk in the Bosphorus on the last day of Constantinople, can it come clawing its way out, sputtering up in Istanbul? I ask because I like to think that words and stories are slippery, but stay the same at heart. Small words, all of us, and that we're just going around and around again, so many chances to finally get it right. So there's two boys, once there was and wasn't, once there wasn't, two boys, both girls, walking down Valencia Street, and this being San Francisco, they're both wearing vests and hats, and one of them is saying, be honest, the fez, on or off, what's cute, what looks better? And between their hands is all the meowing, head-tight baggage of where we came from and how we got here, and sometimes drippy and overflows. And history is such a drowned zombie cat. It's stupid and tragic and drippy and overdramatic and funny, and it has claws. And I like to imagine that even those of us that grew up not knowing could do the right thing, and that it would all that all it would take to untie all the bad knots is all, <clears throat> and that all it would take to untie all the bad knots is maybe one finger, maybe two, maybe more. And after all these centuries, we could still come up together gasping on the shore because there isn't all that much difference in words after all. And because it would have turned out in the end that a pussycat is pretty resilient, even a dead one. Thank you so much.